What a mighty God we serve. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put poor Humpty back together again. Well, that's not the depth of the sermon today. But it's certainly a good illustration as we talk about the church and what God's called us for and how God wants to use the church. This is the beginning of a seven, uh, seven or eight, nine-part sermon series. We'll see how, we, how well we listen as we go through it as we talk about the church and the relevance of the church and the importance of the church. What does Humpty Dumpty have to do with it? Well, it's just Humpty Dumpty represents so many people in our world today who've had a great fall and their lives are destroyed and their lives are shattered and they just don't seem to know what to do. They think the government's going to help. They think that somebody in uh, culture is going to come to the rescue. There's all kinds of antidotes and solutions that our culture does offer, but none of them are what Humpty needs. What Humpty needs is to be a member of Believer's Fellowship Church. Amen. Amen. Humpty needed a good church where he could find all the pieces being put together properly and righteously in a way that God ordained for us to have our parts put together. And the resource for that is not any other resource, but ultimately the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that God has placed upon the, uh, on the earth as his body to carry out his mission. And we want to start this series this morning. In fact, uh, I know Tim briefly said something a while ago about our Lift Connect. We're going to be covering this material much deeper in our Lift groups because there's just a ton of stuff to be covered as we go through this. And I, I had 13 pages of notes to kind of show you what I normally come to the pulpit with is maybe for at most five pages of notes usually, but you know, there's just a, I am not even going to try to get through all of it, so don't worry, you'll make it to lunch before the Methodist, all right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but anyway, there's just, when you start talking about the church and, and what it means and what God intended for the church, it's just, it just continues to, to open up and open up and open up. Now, for those in, the, in our study groups, you'll be using Tony Evans' book on the Glorious Church as kind of a guide for that, and the sermon uh, outlines are breaking forth from that particular book. I told my wife one of the hardest things I'd do is take a book like that that somebody's written and try to preach from it. So we've taken the nuts and bolts and some of the illustrations. Lift leaders are reading the material and preparing it for further discussion and teaching in our lift group. So get, get connected. Go tonight. Maybe you haven't been a member of a lift group, but this is a great, great Sunday to do that on. Find a group as you leave the church today. They'll be out there in their yellow shirts today and get connected on some level. But this series is about the church. In case you don't know, the church is the visible manifestation of the universe church, which makes up all Christians who've been born again, anybody that's come to Christ since the day of Pentecost to the present day, all through history, all the way up to the rapture of the church. Now, we need to understand what that means for us as a people and as well as individuals. We are saved, praise God, individually, but we fulfill the will of God within the kingdom of God corporately as a body, the church. It's important if you're a Christian to be a part of a church fellowship. You can't function properly in God's will for your life outside of a local assembly of believers. People ask, well, where does it say you could be in church on Sunday? Hey, listen, half of the New Testament tells you that. Don't show your ignorance by saying something like that. Because half of the New Testament talks about the importance and the priority of you being vested in a body of believers where there is a pastor and leadership and governance according to the Word of God and to the will of God. There is structure, there's a goal, there's vision, there's mission, there's passion, there's something that God is working out within each local assembly of God-ordained believers, amen? So you need to be a part of a fellowship. And you need to find out what God's place for you is in that fellowship. We are God's way of meeting the needs of the culture that we're in. Tony Evans put it this way. He says, you know, the, the local church must understand their identity and purpose for their existence and provide a biblically healthy context for believers to grow and live out the, the lives by, their lives by faith. In other words, God has a place for you in the body of Christ. You're just part of the, the whole makeup. And you need to understand what that is and what the church is about, and what the Bible calls the mystery of the church that had been hidden from the ages. God's eternal plan was for a church to be established as the bride of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of stuff to cover here, and we're going to be covering it 
for several, well, nine weeks, as I said, at least, as we go through this study and look and see what the Lord has to say. Too many, I believe, kind of have the idea, and I know a lot of pastors uh, have the idea, kind of see the church as, as primarily a, a weekly center for spiritual motivation and spiritual inspiration, you know, that you know, then just, just get through the week and get my head to church so I can make it through the week. They don't see it as God sees it, as God's only ordained place where Jesus manifests himself to the world around us. And we miss the glory. We've missed the beauty, we've missed the majesty, we've missed the, the importance, the vision many times as a result of that, of what God is doing in the world today. So we have to understand our identity. We need to understand our purpose, because the world is in chaos. You don't have to look long, you don't have to watch the media long, listen to the news long, to see that the world's a mess today. I mean, you just look on the news, the economic mess, militarily, worldwide problems are going on, nations fighting against nations, all the things that Jesus prophesied are going on in the culture around us. But even, even though they were prophesied, we also were prophesied, is that mystery that had been hidden from the ages, to make a difference in the culture that we live in. And that's what God has designed for us, to be a unique powerful body that moves forward and transforms the culture around us as we do move forward. Yes, in reality, things are going to get worse as far as the world's concerned, but if we'll be what God's called us to be, then things will only get better in regard to what God will do with us and what God will do for us, all right? But the church, as we look at this study, we see the church comes into the, to, to play into the world that we're living in because we are, if you believe the Bible, the most important institution on the earth. Now, I know a lot of people don't believe that. They think, you know, that Congress perhaps is, or the White House is, or the Supreme Courts, the justices. You know, that's probably one of the most powerful institutions. There is no greater, nor more powerful, nor ordained institution such as the Bride of Christ, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to get a grip on that. We need to understand that and believe it. Because if we do believe that we are the most important institution, then we won't be casual about our churches. We won't be casual about our commitments. We won't be casual about our relationship to the body of Christ. In fact, I believe the more a person understands this mystery of the church, as the Bible calls it, which is now revealed to us, if we'll take the time to see it, the more that we get committed to what the Bible says, the more we'll be committed to a local assembly of believers who are making a difference in their, in their world for Christ because we are God's method of changing the world. The church and only the church has been commissioned by the sovereign Lord God to be his representative agency in history. Just read the scriptures. This is what God has done. This is how he's chosen to do it. We are all born and saved as individuals. Yes, all right? But just as a child is born... As an individual, he is birthed into a family, and we know that if a child is going to grow up, be healthily, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, then he needs that family institution and that family relationship to be well-balanced. A godly home and a godly family can change a child's life. We know what happens when a fathers and mothers are missing, as so many are in our culture. The church is God's way of making a difference. And you say, the home, well, what about the home? It's a sacred institution. Yes, it is. But even the home is a manifestation, an example, an illustration of what the church is to be. If you read Ephesians where it talks about husbands and wives and the relationship to one another and how we are to represent the, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ and his relationship to his body, which is the church of Jesus Christ. So there's a lot to say, there's a lot to cover, but I'll put it pretty simply that if we are God's commissioned agency is by, by, by his sovereignty, that given the authority to open up the treasures of God's kingdom to the world to make a difference in the world, then we need to realize just how important we are. And I think we'll also realize that as the church goes, if the Bible's true, so our culture goes. So if the culture is in, wreck, in a wreck and in a, in, in a shamble and in a mess, and many times that's pretty descriptive of where the church has been. I've heard it said many times by real prophets of God that that will say something like this. If you want to find someone to blame for the cultural mess that we find ourselves in today, start at the church, start at the pulpits. We're here to make a difference, and if the difference is not being made, then something's wrong. We need to get back to what God designed and realize that we are the epicenter of culture, and the church's strength, or ultimately the weakness, can be a major determining factor in the success or the failure of the civilization and the world around us. We can make a difference, and we're here to make a difference. But the question gets back, will we be that strong 
influential power? Will we make the difference? Will we let God use us? Or will we choose to be weak in the culture? What's God's design? Obviously, the Bible says that we're to be the, the city that's set on a hill. The light that shines. We're to be the salt of the earth. And over and over through Scripture, you see what, what, is, what God tells us to be. At the same time, turn on the news. We see the culture around us. And we see that this world seems to be collapsing on so many levels. What do we need? What's the answer? How's Humpty Dumpty going to be put back together again? It's not going to be all the king's horses. It's not going to be all the king's men. It's not going to be the administration. It's not going to be the White House. It's not going to be Congress. It's not going to be the Republicans, the Libertarians, the Democrats, or anybody else that's going to transform people's lives. It is us, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is to be out there and making a difference. Now, you say, oh, Brother Joe, I look around, man, we got big problems. Like, we got God-sized problems. We do have some big problems, but we need to realize that we are a mighty force to be reckoned with at the same time. And once we discover our identity, as Dr. Evans says, and our purpose, we can make the difference because we've been given everything we need. Now, as I, I'm going to share a passage with you out of 2 Chronicles 15, 3 in just a moment. But as I get into this passage, you're going to see there are many parallels to the culture that we're living in today and what it was like under King Asa and as the prophet Azariah speaks to him from that passage. But in looking at the whole problem and overviewing the culture as well as what it was centuries ago under King Azariah, and many problems were similar and much the same as what we're facing today, you're going to see that the, that the people of God, the nation of Israel, was not being who they were supposed to be. And because they were not being what they were supposed to be, the culture was also deteriorating around them. When the church is strong, when we realize as members of the body of Christ our eternal purpose, when we choose to move forward in those purposes, individually acting together as a group, as a family, as a body, it's amazing what God will do. But the problem is big. Underlying all the problems, let's remember that everything that is visible, everything we see, we touch, we taste, we feel, we can put our hands around, we, we, it's physical, it's visible, <clears throat> that's not the real problem. All right? There are things that we don't see, things that we can't taste, things that we can't put our hand on that are just as real as the physical. There is a spiritual world in operation where there is a God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, where there is the kingdom of God, where, you, where the angel also operate. There's also that element of that spiritual invisible world, which is that ungodly side, the demonic side. There is a real prince of darkness. His name is Satan. He's a genuine real being, all right? He's a real personality. He's not a force. He's a personality. He's a fallen angel. At his beck and call are one-third of all the heavenly hosts that were in heaven one time. Now, that's probably in the tens or hundreds of thousands, if not the millions, that were fallen. The apostle John said when he was caught up into heaven, he saw round about the throne of God ten thousands of ten thousands of thousands of angels worshiping God. Now, if I do the math. That gets up, I guess, into billions. I'm not sure. One third have already gone. But out in, around us every day in the world operating are the things that we do not see, those invisible things that are operating out there. And I want you to know that the visible world is really being controlled by the invisible world. The physical is really being controlled by the spiritual. In case you don't know it, that has always been the fact. And the only way which we are going to fix the physical world is to operate from the spiritual world. If we think we can fix it through bills and, and economy and protest in the streets of major cities, then we're wrong. Because the problem is much, much deeper than that. Until the invisible world is operating properly in the way that it should be operating, which we are part of that world, then the visible world cannot be addressed in any lasting way or any effective way. Thus, I would say to America, an election is not going to change us. The church is here to make a difference. We are here to bring about radical change. All right? Now, I'm not saying that we don't be light and salt in the world. We should vote. We should vote not our conscience. We ought to vote God's conscience. We ought to vote this Bible. We find candidates that line up closest to what Scripture teaches. Those are the candidates we embrace. Not the ones who make the nicest promises or sing the loudest praise or have the, the best oratory or the most handsome or, you know, their hair combed just right, but the ones that are closest to what God 
would say is a righteous ruler of the nations. Now, not by words only, we know that. Now, as we get into 2 Chronicles, understand this is a time of great chaos that the, that, 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 uh, the prophet Azariah is addressing. He said, for a long time, Israel, he's, again, he's talking to the king, talking about times past, Israel was without true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, he was found by him. In those days and in those times, there was no peace to him who went out or him who came in, for great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. Times were bad, in other words. They were broken in pieces, nation crushed by nation, and city by city. For God troubled them with every sort of distress. There's a couple of things I want you to realize, but I do want you to remember what I said about the spiritual affecting the visible. The root of all this, it gets unique as to what is being said here. Azariah, prophet, is speaking again to King Asa. He's saying, Asa, you have made some great reforms. You need to continue those reforms because they're godly reforms because we don't want to go back to where we were. And he's, in verse 3, he's talking about when we were at our lowest spiritual point, many days we were without the true God, without teaching priests, without law. Verse 4 refers back to the time when they began to seek God. And the prophet summarized the chaos in verse 6 and verse 5 of all the judgment they were going through. But several things are really worth noting here, all right, that we need to pull out of this. For instance... The description of society, there was crime, there was violence, there was deterioration among, among the whole culture, conflict in the world. It was a bad situation and bad times, much like the chaos and the confusion of the world that we're living in today. Verse 6 says, but all this came about because why? The devil, the demons, sitting no, God troubled the people. God was up to something. And any time that God troubles you, you got problems. When God's your problem, you got problems. When God's your solution, praise God, you have a great solution. But this is about Israel's history here. What was it about their history that caused God to trouble these people? Well, the root problem is found in verse 15, verse 3, when there's three elements that are mentioned in here. And like I say, you go to the lift group, now these will be discussed on a, on a deeper level. First was a, they were without a lack of, of true knowledge. A lack of the true knowledge of the true God. And what is happening here is it does not say that God withdrew himself from Israel so the people would forgot who he was or they could no longer find him. It's basically they didn't know the true God. They were mixing all kinds of paganism and idolatry and worldliness along with their Judaistic roots and their faith and the, the, the word that God had given them. They were kind of bringing in everything else in the world to make it palatable so that people would come to get a bigger crowd, to make it acceptable. God says, you know, when they were like that, that just opens the door for more problems. The second thing is, they were without a teaching priest. Israel was without a teaching priest. Somebody who would really steer and direct and teach them from the Word of God what the Word of God really said. Now, don't misunderstand me. Every one of us are responsible to get in that Bible and to read what it says, to understand it, and to embrace it so that we live transformed lives. But God is, tell and God is telling the people here, Part of the problem is you got preachers who won't preach the Word of God. you got preachers who are more interested in a paycheck or popularity or something like that or having a bigger building or a bigger crowd than they are about telling the truth and voicing what the Scriptures has to tell us. That's why you have sermons today that go out to congregations that are based on what we call felt need. What do we feel the need is, you know? So let's talk about victory, and let's talk about prosperity, and let's talk about how to find favor, and how to get the blessing, and how to make every day beautiful, on and on and on it goes. We've missed the point. We teach, we preach. Ultimately, there's really two driving forces. One, to know God on a greater level, to have him be more intimate with him. But two, to impact the culture, to make a difference in the world that we're living in. When you don't understand properly the Word of God and your relationship to God, and obedience is going to always be weak. And there's a systematic failure that's taking place in the nation of Israel at this point. I mean, and even in the heart of Israel. But it's really not just in the nation. It's in the heart of Israel's leadership. And God holds prophets and priests and teachers of the Word of God responsible to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God, not just what's palatable for people. But there's a lack of knowledge a lack of biblical teaching, and the third part, a lack of correct application. In 1 Chronicles 15, 3, and it really, if you think about it, it kind of flows as a natural consequence of the first two, does it not? 
If you don't get it here and you have understanding right and not getting instructed by having the witness of a preacher, pastor, an evangelist, a teacher in the Word of God with you, then certainly the application is going to be all wrong. And a lot of people, they like to teach the truth even, some churches, but they won't give you an application to that truth, how the truth will affect your life. Your life will be affected, affected, infected by the truth of God's Word when you start to embrace it and you start to receive it. So there's a, a lack of correct application here. The people of Israel didn't know how to, how to bring God's truth to bear on their real world. And I want you to know, this truth is so biblical and so applicable. I've heard preachers say, though, in interviews and conferences, well, you know, you know, there's so much of the Bible, it's just not practical, it's not applicable. What planet are they from? No, it's this. It's, it's the, those parts that they don't want to read are parts that call them to be changed and transformed or corrected or, or reproved or to, to make a difference. We have moral chaos. We have spiritual chaos in the land. And I think it goes back to what Asa was, was hearing from the prophet of the day. There, you, we were without a lack of true knowledge. We were without a lack of biblical teaching. And we were, the la we were there without a lack of correct application. Big problem we're facing in the world. Big issues. Crisis on every hand, problems, economic woes, nation against nation and crushing nation. Oh, doesn't it all sound just pretty much where we are today and what's going on? Yeah. So what's our position in all the midst of this moral chaos, this demise that we find ourselves in? Well, there is a God-ordained solution. We don't just have big problem. we got a big God. Since the basic realities of spiritual conflict and the superior power of the spiritual world haven't changed since the day of the judges and the, and, and the, and the priests of Israel and ancient Israel. We see the same principle of the invisible world being controlled by the invisible world at work today. Those forces haven't changed. They're still in operation, and they can still be affected by the same means. That's when Paul he preaches this great treatise to the church about the church and who they are and what they should be and what they should accomplish is in Ephesians, and we'll look through a lot of Ephesians in our study together. He kind of came down to this point to say, listen, everything that's going on is because there's a war going on. Our struggle is not in the White House. Our struggle is not in the Supreme Court. Our struggle, is not, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. What's he saying? We have a big conflict on our hand, and it's not a physical conflict. It can only be won from a spiritual format, in a spiritual position, from a spiritual place of battle. We're wrestling against demonic forces. Rulers and principalities and powers. Those all deal with different demonic levels of, of reign and rule that Satan's trying to capture people's hearts and minds with. So God has a solution for the problem. Now this is God's eternal statement, basically, in Ephesians, and his eternal plan is all laid out there. But in Ephesians, he, he tells us that there, there's a vehicle that I've introduced into the cosmos, into the physical practical, real world, and therein is the answer, therein is the solution for the problem today. You say, what is it that God has brought into reality to deal with the problems that we face in our culture and our society? The solution to the problem is the church. Let me put it this way, the solution to the problem is here in this room. Because if we just talk about the church and gleaning generalities, then certainly we're going to miss what God's saying. You're the church. I'm the church. We make up the church. And the glorious thing is that God wants to use us, and God has a plan to use us. It's all about us getting into the world, into the culture that we have been born into. So we say, for such a time as this, and being what God's called us to be, and say, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where the battle is taking place. And so the church is birth. And the scripture talks about this mystery that's hidden, been hidden from the ages. But Jesus makes this statement about the church. In fact, he, he starts preaching on the church in, in the book of Matthew. And, and he, starts, he calls the disciples together sometime before the crucifixion. He takes them up to Mount Hermon. At the base of Mount Hermon is a little place called Caesarea Philippi. where beautiful three or four places underneath the mountain where the, the water comes pouring out. It, it, it's a beautiful sight. And you he takes his disciples up there to get away with him and, and have some group discussion and group teaching. And he sits down in the discussion and he primes up the discussion by, in Matthew 16 as he starts talking to them about the church. And this is the first mention of the word church. So obviously, 
if it's all about the church, we ought to see where Jesus first mentions it and what his goal is and how he's going to do this and what his plans are. And he talks about the ecclesia. So we have this first use of this word in regard to the children of God, the born-again saints of God, where he calls us that called-out people, that called-out ones, and we're called out for specific reasons and purpose, by the way. He starts the discussion like this. He said, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And there's a group, they begin to chime in. You can almost see the, the group. One, one stand, hey, I have the answer. Some say that you're John the Baptist. I'm sure that brought a chuckle. Got his head back. Others say you're Elijah. And even some say Jeremiah and somebody else. Well, some of them think you're one of the prophets. And so they're all chiming in. And he said to him, who do you? And by the way, the you there is plural, okay? Not just who do you, Peter, but who do you say that I am? So the discussion's taking place. We don't see the details of it. We just see the overview of it. So Simon Peter replied, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and uh, the kingdom, uh, kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Good answer, Peter. <laughs> you got it right. Don't let it go to your head. You got that from God. It wasn't original. But the idea here, when he's talking to them in the context of you and Peter answering for you, the idea is given of a, there, there's a, a consensus among the group that he is the Christ. You know, he is the son of the living God. This, you're, you're, you, are, you are the ones you're, that, that people are looking for. You're, you're the hope for the nations. Now here he's telling what he's getting ready to do and he's disclosing to them their goals and their purposes and all that goes on and he's giving them this idea about this church, this, this ecclesia. How's he going to reach the world? How's, he going to, how's the message going to go out? How's the difference going to be made? How's the spiritual going to really impact you know, the physical world around us? So he said, well, there's this special assembly that I'm calling out and I'm going to build this ecclesia, these called out people on, on this rock. Now, they're up in the northern part of Israel, and they're having this discussion, and the question comes up, well, who am I? They give it right. Peter steps forward. In a context, again, remember, this is kind of an open discussion going on. It's almost as though he's the leader of the group, the spokesman for the group, and he declares, you know, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. Who you say I am? It's important not what the rest of everybody says, says I am. Who do you say I am? By the way, that's a good question for us to answer individually. Who do I say that Jesus really is? Well, he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Heaven has revealed this to you. Now, it's important, obviously, the disciples agree on the answer. <laughs> All right. But then Jesus speaks to them and starts talking to them about how this church is going to be established and what the foundation is going to be. But the clear implication is the other 11 disciples are there and they're all in agreement with everything that's being said by the Apostle Peter. This passage of Scripture is one of the most controversial passages of Scripture in the New Testament. Theologians, professors, pastors, doctors have gone a million different directions, it seems. The Catholics, on one hand, they say, well, this is, you know, this is the priesthood. This is the priesthood and is being established here of, 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 of the church. And, you know, the... Uh, Peter's the first pope, and he's going to be elected to be the, the and he gives to Peter the, the keys to the kingdom, and, you know, he's going to, so we're going to set up this priesthood that's going to be representative of the, of the leadership, and the pope is going to be the representative, uh, he's, the, he's like Jesus in the, incarnate in the flesh, you know, so he speaks it, it rules, no matter what anybody else says, what the Bible, if the pope says it's right, because he's got the keys to the kingdom, and so we have the Catholic Church formatting after this. Then you see others who say, well, you know what he's talking about here. You know, is it, it that Peter's foundational to the church and, uh, and that th Jesus says upon this rock, and, and I really believe part of this is true when he talks about this. Well, Jesus said, what you've gotten is a revelation from heaven, and it's upon this rev rock of revelation that I'll build my church, all right? Well, we know that's partly true as well. And we also know that ultimately Jesus is the cornerstone, right? But he's the cornerstone. But what are we? And what, what's the foundation for this church? I believe it's given in, in, in the truth here. If we just kind of take it down and break it down a little bit, it's certainly not that Peter's the rock on which the church is built. 
That's not what Jesus said. In fact, Jesus is using a play on words that's important to understand. It's important to understand because it gives us the clue to what Jesus is doing as far as the foundation, as far as the church is establishing. Peter is the word, when he speaks to him here, of the word Petros. He said, I give to you, I say that you are Peter, and upon this rock are Simon Barjonas, and I build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. The word here is Petros, That's a, and it's a masculine form of the word for rock, all right? I'm, you're a rock, and, and I'm saying to you, rock, but it's, it's, it's a masculine form. Because what he says, I say to you, Peter, upon this rock, which is it's like rock, masculine form, and then the second rock here is feminine of the word, petros, all right? It's not the masculine form of the word. It's the feminine form of the word, and he's saying, you know, I, I, I'm telling you, this is the slab or the rock of which I'm going to build my church. What do you mean? Well, the Greek is unique in the classical language as it talks about this word. The word for petras, petra, feminine, is a collection of stones. They're knitted together to form like a large rock or a ledge or a slab. That all these rocks, and he's saying, listen, God has revealed this to you. And I'm saying to you, Peter, a rock, that I'm going to build my church on the collection of you apostles. But it's not just you apostles. It's everybody who gets saved will be a part of this, 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 whole, this whole building, this foundation that's, that's being established here. It's in fact, didn't what Peter went on to say himself? He said, listen, you are lively stones. You're part of the whole church. We're all built up to be the house of God and the temple of God, as he calls it in 2 Peter. In other words, the foundation, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's, as well, he is the head of the church. He's the protection for the church. But we, along with the disciples, along with Peter and all the other apostles, all those who believed and confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, we come together, and as we come together, we form this larger entity, this big stone called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Call back soon. No, it's not my brother, but I would have answered it and put him on for everybody to hear. There's a larger slab and a larger ledge that is there for us. And that is what we are a part of. Who's the cornerstone? Who's the head? It's Jesus, but praise God. Isn't it exciting to know that we're a part of this, that we are, we are part and parcel of everything that, that God is doing? And the strong support for this view is, is in the latter statement of Peter himself, you know, and when, when he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, 5, we are all lively stones being built up together into a spiritual house of God. So here we are. Peter has a key role, obviously, to play in the church. He becomes the spokesman, the leader in so many ways. He gives us direction. But I believe what the Lord is saying here, in effect, is this. Peter, you are a stone, but I'm not building my church on individual stones, around individual people. There are many stones that will come together to form my church and my bride. That we make up the house of the living God. That every one of us are like an important part of a large piece of puzzle. That we are there to be a part of of the solution, that we are part of Christ, that we are part of his body. And if you read through Ephesians, and we'll do an overview next Sunday of the whole book, just in a real boom, 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 it's an overview, and we'll look and we'll see that every one of us has been gifted by God within this large foundation to play a part, to be important, to be significant, that God has gifted us all. Like what Tony Evans says in his book, if you go through there, he talks about the importance of every believer discovering their place in the body of Christ. He said, in fact, you really can't, you're, you're really not received into membership at our church officially until you become part of a ministry somewhere in the body. In other words, you know how we have our classes we go through, the journey class we go through, and you, you participate in anything, and Journey 301, that last class, which a lot of people don't like to go to for whatever reason. But that's one of the most important classes we do because there we talk about spiritual gifts and your place and help you by the end of that class to find your place in the body of Christ and follow up later by talking to you and praying with you and discovering what your heart, your vision, your passion is so you can plug in. In fact, Tony Evans goes on to say in his book, if you don't do that and all you do is come to church and you kind of come in for your motivational speech or your inspirational word, then you're, you know, you're not really a part of the church. You're just a leech. I didn't say that. He wrote it. I'm just quoting it, all right? 
But you know, that, that is so true in so many churches, and I praise God. But we just had a leadership meeting. There were 100 plus people in that leadership meeting. of people who were involved in ministries and, and actively participating. There was another 20, 30 people that couldn't be there because of different problems in their work or whatever that was going on. To know that that many people are participating in ministries, that honors God. So many churches, it's 10% of the whole doing everything. Carrying the load, giving the money, doing the ministries. That's not what God intended for the church. But the beautiful part about this, as he's talking about the church and these first references, he gives them this, this word. He says, oh, by the way, I'll build my church. In other words, Jesus is doing something in our lives. I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. And I know this can be a great discussion tonight as you talk about this on a greater level, but the idea here is that, that we are, we're not on the defensive here, we're on the offensive here, and the gates of hell will not prevail as we move forward. We're not hiding out, building ivory temp uh, temples and towers somewhere. We're moving forward wherever we are in our culture, wherever we are in our job, our office, our community, our neighborhood, making a difference, shining like lights, being the salt of the earth. And the Bible says, you march forward, the gates of hell won't stand against you. That's a great promise. What's he saying here? You can see the visible world. There's an invisible world in operation. And as you move forward, you're going to encounter that invisible world. But I'm going to give you everything. The, the authority of Satan will not prevail against you. It won't be able to handle it. Now, this is where we go back and we get a quick little understanding of everything we're facing. We'll close with this, the angelic conflict. The church comes right in the middle of a conflict that began not on earth, but in, in heaven many thousands of years ago. We don't know how long ago. And it's not going to be finished until Jesus comes and jails the devil at the end of time. And hell is locked up and the keys are thrown away and the devil's cast into it. There's a conflict. There was a day when Satan rose up in rebellion against God. You've read those passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel that give a description of the devil. It called him the most beautiful angel in heaven. The light of the bear, the, the star of morning, the sun of dawn. And the Bible says of Lucifer and Ezekiel, but your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. Couldn't look at himself in the mirror without just having a little church over himself. Man, I'm good looking. Nobody in heaven's good looking as me. Hey, listen, I think I, I, I have got it so much together. I don't like to be listening to God. I think I'll be God. And he rose up in a rebellion against God. And he took one third of the heavenly host with him. And God brought him into judgment, the beginning of judgment, not the final judgment. In Isaiah 14, 12, it says he was cut down to the earth. Now this is, at some point in time in creation, the Bible tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was what? It was void, without form. Now God created everything beautiful. Why does the earth become f without form and void? Literally, it means it was just a dump. It was a garbage place. Because Satan is there. That's where he's been deposed to. That's where he's been cast into. Because God's going to deal with the devil. How is God going to deal with the devil? Us under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man who is made lower than the angels, the Bible says, is going to put that chief angel in his place. God's going to bring his judgment upon all, all of the cosmos. And the beauty of it is that God laid his hand upon a man, and it's his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who became a man, stepped out of eternity, clothed himself, and became like us lowly creatures, lower than the angels, the Bible says. And what are we going to do? Little old nothing us. Little old little us against such spiritual mighty forces as angel beings, especially Lucifer, an archangel, a chief angel. Jesus said, not to worry. I'm putting you in this conflict, and you're going to win because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. God uncovers Lucifer's rebellion, puts him and the angels that followed him on trial for treason, and cuts them down to the earth because he was full of pride. And there he stays. And God put the devil here, and then God created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden. God knew they were going to have a conflict. But what did God tell Adam? You take authority here. It's your responsibility to take charge, to manage this planet, to be steward of the planet, to be fruitful, to multiply, to rule, and to reign. Not to let Satan rule, not to let Satan reign. God knew the devil was in the garden. And God knew that Adam would eventually fail, but God raised up mankind to be the reckoning force because God would come in to that fallen mankind and redeem that man and raise him up and put together his church, which would be the reckoning force to keep the devil in check. 
until the time would come of his final authority being imposed upon the earth when Jesus will come with the host of heaven. It's a beautiful thing when you think about it, that God would use us, those, those creatures that are lower than the angels, that God would use us, those of us who have no real spiritual visible power at all, but God would give us the keys of the kingdom and he'd give us what we need. He would make us new creations and he would bind us together as a mighty force to be reckoned with and we would make a difference in the world around us. Now let me read you this quote from why God would do this and from uh, Anthony Evans. He said this, he said, The God had conferred in Trinitarian session and declared that Satan's rebellion and judgment be used as an opportunity to demonstrate his power, his glory, his justice, and his righteousness, not only to Satan and his demons and to themselves, but to all creation, including man. After all, Satan's rebellion had cast a cloud over the throne of God. He rises up in rebellion. I mean, it's one thing for your children to say no, isn't it? What are you going to do if your little boy says no, your little girl says no? You're going to take him to the other room and you say, you do that again, and you're going to put him in the corner, you're going to time out, you might do something like that, you might even swat on the pants, all right? But what if your little boy walks up and just slaps the fire out of mama? There's getting ready to be a demonstration <laughs> to every other child in the family. And this is exactly what happens. God's getting ready to put the devil on, and that's what the Ephesians teaches, Colossians, that all the universe and all the world and all the cosmos would know that God is greater still. He can take puny man, redeem him, make him an overcomer. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, he said. This means that God gives us what we need. By the way, he didn't say, I'll give you the keys of the church, did he? I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. In fact, it's plural keys, and you can talk about this a little bit more because there's multiple problems that we face, but God's got multiple answers for everything that we will ever encounter. The word refers not to called out body believers, which is the church, the word kingdom. It refers to God's comprehensive rule over all creation. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Isn't it a, isn't it a great thing that we can be a part of building the kingdom? If that we can be a part of saying, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, that we can be establishing, that we can be pressing out, moving out, building the kingdom, that's our responsibility. We're not greater than the kingdom. We're here to exalt and to, to build and to expand the kingdom of God so that he rules over all creation and over all things. How's he doing it? For those of us who trust and believe and receive his will and his word. God created the church to be his agency in this age to represent his bigger plan. The bigger plan is his kingdom. You get to be a part of that. I get to be a part of that. The more we discover that, and we're going to talk about it on a much deeper level over the next eight, nine weeks, the more we discover it, the more excited we're going to be, the more involved we're going to be, the more committed we're going to be, and I think the more radical, the more bold, and the more courageous we'll be because we'll discover that we can move forward and the gates of hell can't handle us. They can't overcome us. The keys to the kingdom God has placed in our hands. The access and the authority that Jesus has given the church is underscored in Matthew 16, 19. God has given us access to his kingdom whereby we can stand to be what he's called us to be. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. What's that mean? That God has a kingdom in which he's the head of, which Jesus is the head over the body, that the orders come from headquarters, what we call it headquarters. He's the head. The orders don't come out of my tent. They don't come out of my will. They don't come out of what I want. They come out about what God wants. And so when we report to headquarters, we get the instruction. Because as the Apostle Paul loved to refer to the church, we are the body, he's the head. Now, folks, a body without a head is kind of a freaky thing. You'll see a lot of it this time of year. All right? But we're not a body without a head. We have a head, and he's the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything in our life should represent that, from our marriage to our individual lives to how we conduct our business and how we relate to the world around us. We believe that Jesus is in authority and that he is the head of the body. And I want you to know that what is needed is for us to discover the power and the authority that is ours, and we realize that we don't fight for victories. We fight from victory because we are in Christ Jesus. Gift from the church. The keys, the gift from the church, the authority of prayer to bind, to release according to what God's will might be in, in whatever we're binding and releasing. The problem is the church has gotten enamored with too many other things. Being the biggest, putting on the best show, having the largest crowd, having the best program, having the most authority, 
In fact, a lot of guys have been distracted by, I've got to get in the White House, and I can be a picture with the president, and I can be a, a presidential counselor. Power thirsty and power hungry and forgot we had all the power we need in Christ Jesus. We need to get back to him. And I believe that if we go through this study, and you'll be, if you'll be consistent, and you'll get in the Word with me, and you'll read through this, and you'll participate in these groups that we're talking about in our Live Connect, you get, just commit some to these weeks that we're in this study, I believe it will transform your life. I believe you'll have a greater vision and a greater passion, and like I say, a greater boldness, if that's what you want. God has called us to make disciples. Why? Because he is about a big task. We don't need just people who are tenders, he said. I need disciples. We should all have hearts that are committed to being a disciple. And discipleship is so important. But you can't be a disciple if you're not going to have disciplines. It takes time. It takes sacrifice. It takes commitment. Amen? I may not get to watch the Sunday night football game. Desperate housewives. We want to call desperate church members, don't we? <laughs> if that's their excuse. Come on. Well, I mean, we're, we're, the culture's sick. Yeah. And we're like the children of Israel just soaking it in for the entertainment value. We get back to being the movers and the shakers that God's called us to be. Amen? Amen. You say, well, look at me, I'm nobody. That just means you'd be a bigger mover and a bigger shaker. The less you realize you are, the more God can do. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. amen. God's good. Would you stand with me? If you're here without Christ, then you stand outside literally.